who is your your favorite uh, ten to play with up in Ulster? Oh Jesus! You're, <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to say Ian, obviously, but B- B- Billy Burns very emotional. He'd be heartbroken to he come in and, and make me feel bad. So. <laughs> I'll just say it was Christian Leo Fano when he was here and he's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game changed. Hello and welcome along to House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe and together with Guinness. I'm Ian Constantine and I am joined, as always, by Ian Madigan. It's episode 15 and we have had some amazing guests on so far and today it is no different. Ian. Take it away. I'll let you give the honours of introducing this guy. Yeah, John Cooney, Guinness Pro 14 winner with Leinster, Connacht and soon to be Ulster. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's, it's interesting having you on the other side of the, the mic. <laughs> yeah, slightly different, all right. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll get straight into it, John. What, what did you make of the game last night? Obviously not the result we wanted up in Ulster with uh, Leinster getting another win. Yeah, I think it's the first time I've ever been up for Munster in a, in a rugby game. Um, I think we grew up not really being the biggest fan of them and from playing them, there's always a, a lot of niggle, so I can't say I really support them, but um, I was good to see them lose at the end. I thought uh, probably for the first 60 minutes, they were, they were really in command and a few things didn't go their way. Just the turn of turn of rugby and, and the way Lance always grinded out at half time for that six-point turn, um, it, it always looked like it might come back and bite them at the end, but um, yeah, it was disappointing for us and, and fair play to Lance for coming back. So it scored a serious try. Yeah, Emer is a big yeah. monster supporter. Like, what's the feeling, with, you know, in the camp there? Obviously, it's a tough one to take. Like, I can't imagine how they feel. Like, whatever it is about being a supporter, but imagine waking up today, like, knowing that you were definitely the better team. Leinster played probably for 10 minutes of that game and just did typical Leinster. Like, scored a try out of, you know... It was a great, pay- like Munster's defence had been so good all day that it forced Leinster to try something like a kick in behind. And like only Leinster would it work out for like the way it did. Um, like waking up this morning and I went on Instagram, the first thing that I saw was Leinster rugby put up, you know, like that winning feeling or something like the next morning. Can you imagine how the, the boys are feeling? Like as a, as a as a supporter, I'm gutted for them. So not to talk about it, as a player waking up, knowing, you know, you're always worse the next morning as well. Like if you're, if you lose after a game, you feel 10 times worse. The body is 10 times worse. You feel every ache more the day after a game. So I imagine they're feeling every bit of that game from last night. But, oh, look, like so disappointing. So disappointing knowing that like Munster, we're the better team. And like even Ty Byrne chatting after the game, like you could see the disappointment in him and like what more could he have done? Like what more could Ty Byrne have done? And there were so many of the boys out there, you know, what more could they have given out on the field? Yeah, certainly you could see with the the Munster back row, like I thought Pete, CJ, Ty, they were all brilliant um, last night, you know, came up with some good turnovers. The Munster defence was unbelievable on their line. And I thought it was very good throughout the game. But ultimately, for me, what killed them was giving away s- stupid, unnecessary penalties around the middle of the pitch when, you know, their defensive line is set. It wasn't like Leinster were really going forward or, or, or had Munster under big pressure and they'd give away a penalty for coming offside or not rolling away. And, you know, while Leinster didn't punish them, you know, unduly once they got into their 22, it just, you know, it still added up to three points, six points, and then even, you know, the, the last try, like it came from, a, you know, a silly offside penalty from the middle of the pitch when the team's not under pressure. Suddenly, Leinster get a, a line out on the 22, execute a good set piece play, you know, granted to get a small bit of luck, but they've made their own look there. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, a tactical kick that they've put in where they know there's a bit of space um, and it was really well finished. And, you know, suddenly they, they hold out for the, the last 10 minutes and, and it's game over and, it does feel like a bit of a robbery, but at the same time, I think Leinster will say, look, we, we just hung in there and when it counted, we came up with the goods. I suppose the difference is, you know, obviously at the end of the day, you have to score more in the scoreboard, but Munster didn't score for 70, was it 71 minutes? They, 
you know, against a team like Leinster, you have to be taking every opportunity. And I know JJ is getting a lot of stick about missing those kicks. And it wasn't just that, you know, there was other turning points in the game, like those penalties, silly penalties being given away. You know, the kicks did not help. It would have put Munster in a really good position going in at halftime. Like instead of going in 10-6, they would have gone in 13-3. You know, it would have been halftime in a completely different game in the second half. So... I suppose like not to not to put the blame on on JJ like it isn't there's like Bryn knocked on a ball at the end the landing knocked on a ball at the end you know these are just turning points even the kick even the kick that hit the post you know the pens that was given away straight away after that like you know unnecessary so a lot of it was in one's just hands at the end of the day but I suppose as kickers the two of you John like what like how do you bounce back from like do you think the blame like as a kicker do you take that blame on you like do you see that as as your fault as a kicker no, and I actually probably would have been in defence of, of JJ yes, missing that kick. I've missed that kick, I think, three times maybe over the last couple of years. It's actually a bit of a bogey kick uh, for me personally because it's just slide to your right side and if you don't commit to it, you can easily miss it. I missed it in the quarterfinal against Leinster. And, um, in the past, I messaged them after last year uh, saying to keep the head up because it is difficult. I think you're right. I think people forget about the, the penalty Reese Marshall gave away or, or the penalty for offside and, and people kind of put all the blame on him. So I was straight to, to defend him and, and if, if people had gone after him I probably would have went online to defend him because as a kicker you don't lose games I don't think you win games as well I think people put you in those positions to win it and, and me and Ian will put ourselves under pressure to get the kicks but um, it, it's kind of like sport it's so fickle you can't really get ahead of yourself when you get them all because you know when you miss people are going to kind of blame you for it so I've learned over the last few years to try not to get ahead of myself either way and um, so yeah i felt bad for him in that and i know he, i think he's probably up there as, as possibly the best kicker in, in the country bar ian and um, so yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> if you'd ever let me kick johnny <laughs> <laughs> but being um, the him, they, they seem to forget how well he kicked all season and they did it last year as well yes. so and um, i think it's hard no, I- I'd agree with that. I, and I think if you if you look at the game, you know, the, the first kick that he's taken on, like that's a, a big kick in cold weather. The ball doesn't travel out as far. Um, hits a great one from, you know, close to 50 metres. The one before half time for me is a really good kick. He's ended up hitting the inside of the post. It's, you know, an inch from going over. Um, and I'd actually, I'd have big qualms with that one in the second half. The penalty was given away, bang in front of the post. You know, it's a, it's a tap yeah. over. And, wherever it was ended up being awarded because the, the phase of play went on four or five phases, the ref for me has picked the wrong spot out. And, you know, you go from a kick that's a hundred percent, he's going to get it to suddenly it's probably an 85, 90%. He's lifted his head a small bit, maybe early and, and he's just pushed it. And, you know, they're the fine margins. It's a different, different game when they go seven points up there. And, you know, even you're putting Ross under a different, different kind of pressure he's got a kick to draw the game up as opposed to go three points further ahead and at the same time credit to him like that was a cracking kick and it, it makes the last seven eight minutes a very different game that's the thing i think people forget if he didn't get that first kick it's a different like people seem to forget that was a really good kick so he could have easily missed that kick to then get the second one it's the exact same scenario so for him to nail that first kick i think people forget forget that later yeah. on in the game yeah, look, JJ is not top point scorer for for no reason. Like, and it's just it's annoying that people, you know, it's easy to to look at the kicker and say, oh, that's the reason they lost. And I suppose when you dig deeper, there's the penalties, there's the missed tackles, there's you know, a bit of Leinster Leinster flair, and and they're the real reasons that you know, um, I think Munster are blaming even a crooked line out, um, but like you just have to move uh, on. Like the rest of the call, you just play. It. Do you think so? Crooked. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the touch judge is watching there. Yeah, yeah. yeah like they're, so they're, like, The good thing is there was good positives there for, for Munster. Like I thought they had more variation in their game last night. You know, they, they ran the forwards around the corner, running that kind of block play. You know, they sent a forward short, another forward out the back, getting their nine running. And it just created indecision in that Lancer defensive line. And, you know, they make, you know, two, three, five, you know, seven, eight metres and they got their game going really well. They got the ball to width well, especially in the first half. You know, there's there's much more for them to build on with their game now. And compared to how downbeat everyone was after the semi final last year, you know, it was kind of a feeling of Jesus, where are Munster going to go from here? Um, you know, there was questions about what Larkin was doing with the backs. There was no creativity. 
Whereas off the back of that performance last night, you know, they know that they can compete with the very best. Um, and, you know, there is definitely a buzz building down in Limerick and Cork. I think personally, there's a lot of good standout performances from Munster. I think um, Mike Haley was phenomenal in, in 15 and his kicks. I don't know whether they were luck or whether it was just a bounce of a ball, but, you know, to pin Leinster back in within inches of, of the try line, you know, it's it's some really great kicking, but also kind of Murray... Had a had a great game. I think we have to. I suppose as a nine, John, you'd you'd um, appreciate the performance of of Murray last night. Yeah, I, I thought that's the best I've seen him play um, in a while. I thought he had a good mix of his running game and his kicking, and something he's always probably the best in the world at doing his box kicking. And I think he kicked really well. I thought um, Leinster surprisingly in the second half against us a, a week ago. They were we we got a lot of purchase in the first half. Um, and in the second half, they, they started shielding us really well on the way back, whereas I was surprised in the second half against Munster, they didn't really get it together, whereas, as I said, the week before, they did. So uh, Munster got a lot of purchase on, on Larmer kicking, and I think they used it well. The only thing that worried me about Munster's performance was the last five minutes when they did need to score, and they, they kept box kicking. Um, I think when Casey came on, they boxed it three or four times. So I would have liked to see them try to run the ball a bit because Lens were kicking a little bit too long to Haley. I thought they just... Get Haley, take it up quickly, and then play to the width. So, I was that's the only thing that probably worried me about Munster in the last five minutes, similar to the semi final last year, where they needed points and, and they didn't know really what to do at the end. Yeah, like Casey's obviously been very good for Munster this this season, and you know, he's he's a quality player, but he came on and, and he's probably overcooked, you know, definitely three box kicks that should have been contestable. And you know, the one that he does get up contestable, Munster do very well to, to, to win it back, but I think they're the the fine margins that you need from your bench coming on, you know, you need, you need three out of four of them to be accurate, you know, especially when you're going into the final seven or eight minutes of a game and, and, and it's all on the line. It's, you know, two, three point game. Um, So going forward here, I suppose looking like Munster did, Munster did Ulster no favours really last night, you know, you were big Munster fans last night and and rightly so, you know, you're still sitting on top of conference A, but you know, where now, like how much pressure are Ulster on right now just going forward or like how much of how much did you need Leinster to lose that game last night, Ian? Well, I, I think for us, it doesn't change a whole lot. Like we, Leinster were gonna have to come up to um the Kingspan and we were gonna have to beat them regardless. You know, if we if we didn't beat them, we weren't gonna make the final simple as whereas um now it just puts us under a bit of pressure. It means we've got to keep winning our other games with bonus points to to and and beat Leinster to stay ahead. Whereas, you know, a couple of weeks ago, if we just even if it was four one in points uh, in the RDS, it would have meant that if we'd beaten them in Ravenhill, it would have been signed, sealed, and delivered. You know that we would have been the top of our conference. But um, I also think as well the way things are going, I think it's very unusual. It's very unlikely that the the Rainbow Cup will go ahead. So I think what will probably happen is it will just be a standard league season. We'll play everyone home and away. It will be the standard semi-final. You know, the team that comes first in Conference A plays the team that comes second in Conference B. So um, there's still going to be another, I think, 12 or 13 games to go. So um, plenty of rugby to be played. And um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of turns as the season goes on. I know nobody knows the fixture situation at the moment and this year has just been bizarre with like usually our schedules are so penciled in and we know every wake and move that we do and I'm sure you're the same but like when will they make a call like on the Rainbow Cup and like will it revert back to just old Pro 14 um, format then straight away like what are you thinking? Yeah I I was going to make that point what Ian said there it's so uncertain at the moment whether that will go ahead so um, it is quite difficult to know whether we're fighting to, to top the league or not. And it's probably a cliche that you, you say you take each game as it comes, but um, it's, it's hard to sit at home and, and do that sometimes. So, um, yeah, we, I, I don't know when we are going to find out. It's, it's probably all just down to COVID and, and restrictions. And we know in Northern Ireland, we're definitely in it till March. So um, I, I'd say it's highly unlikely that we'll be going to South Africa um, for the new season. So. It's it's kind of just wait and see. It's it's probably been like that for the last year and year and a bit now. So it, it's probably the new normality for us as as uh, human beings up here. How's your you guys both are on what have you had a five week break from from games? Well, we'd have a five week break in in total. So what? How does how hard is it to stay motivated at the moment? You know, without a game, you know, next week or the week after. You know, what what's your target and what's your focus at the moment, John? 
Yeah, um, I, I'm still waiting to see what happens with the Irish squad. I think it's named tomorrow, um, so I'm either either getting a phone call tonight to tell me I'm not, or, or I'll find out probably tomorrow. So, um, that would definitely give me some inspiration to keep going. Otherwise, I'd be lying to say it, it, it would be a little bit difficult to stay motivated for the next four weeks. But uh, luckily, I'm quite vain, um, so I'll probably try to stay in the gym and, and keep, keep, keep the body moving. Um, so yeah, I do find it hard uh, not to train. My problem is I've probably learned in, in the last few years to to stop training because three shoulder surgeries at a young age probably taught me a lesson. So um, yeah, I, I enjoy doing my own training and stuff. I like staying out of Ulster when I don't have to be in there and go to my garage or, or go do whatever I like to do. So um, I'm sure I'll find some sort of inspiration, something to keep me going. So we'll get on to the current season with Ulster and I suppose the next few weeks and hopefully a call up, John, hopefully you'll get that, no, you won't get that phone call and that you'll end up getting the email or whatever it is. But I um, just wanted to start off with this was you and Ian both played together at Leinster and take us way back and I suppose what memories do you have of playing with, with Leinster and playing with Ian? I actually was only thinking of this on my walk there. My first memory, well, I played with them all underage, but I got called up to the Irish 20s a year young um, uh, I was quite loose, I don't know what I was thinking, but I came on, I went for a drop goal, the only time I've ever gone from a drop goal at scrum half, so we had a penalty, I just took a drop goal from the back, bottom of the rock, missed it, um, I think Ian then took, got the kick, went back, went to throw the ball for, uh, for him to kick the ball, and I just remember seeing his face, I threw the pass, and it was so high over his head that he was just looking at <laughs> like, oh crap, he started running back like 15 metres because I threw the ball so far over his head, and luckily he cleared it. And the next day, Alan Clark calls me and drops me from the squad. <laughs> I was. I remember that. that was in Athlone, wasn't it? I, oh god, yeah, that I was trying these games. Like, <laughs> oh crap! You know when you can like jump up and catch it there, but you're just like, oh, this is so far on my head, I can't even do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, those, those under twenty campaigns. Yeah, yeah, it certainly has. Those under twenty campaigns down in Athlone, like they were just it was now it it's it did it definitely suited my um second year at twenties. You know, we had a very good pack and you know, playing on that pitch was such a leveler. Like we had the French and the English coming over who great back lines and yeah. you know, they suddenly they're running in effectively like a marsh pit. But um it's a very different yeah. surface to what they're playing in, in Donnybrook now. Like it's a much faster surface oh. and it probably suits the, the you know the Irish under twenties now the way they're being coached and the way they've played the last few years. But I know whatever ten years ago it definitely suited us as a bit of a leveler and we got some good results out of it. Yeah, definitely. And then I remember us both on the bench for the the final of the, the European Cup. I remember for me that was just a very incredibly bizarre week. I remember I was my third choice and I remember on the Tuesday. I looked around and, and Owen Redden and Isaac Boss were both down with injuries. I was like, oh, crap. I was like, I better know all these plays that we need to know. And I remember having, having to go in and basically run with the starting team. And I'd, I'd never played in Europe. Um, I only had four caps for, for Leinster. Um, and then getting to the Thursday, the main training session, neither of them still training and thinking, oh, Jesus, I'm going to have to play here. Um, and then where it got to the Friday, so the captain's run day. Isaac Boss told me he'd be fine. So I was up the night before till like half 12 with, with Dominic Ryan just messing around and assuming I wouldn't be playing to then in the warm up, have Joe Schmidt sprinting over to me telling me that I'm on the bench. Um, so that was bizarre. I remember coming on with you and, and being really relaxed for some reason because I just thought it was such a such a big game that I can't really come on and do badly. And I remember the two of us came on and just threw the ball around and I'd also yeah. had planes. Uh, I hadn't played in six weeks. I'd lost like five kilos because I broke my jaw. So I went from playing for UL against UL Bows for Lansdowne in the AL to then playing my first game in Euro in the Heineken Cup final. So it was a crazy couple of weeks. And yeah, it was it was a lovely game to come on for us. Um, like as young guys coming on, I can't remember the score when we came on. We were probably about ten points up, but you know the game was broken at that stage. And Ulster were running on fumes and we came on, got some nice set pieces and just were able to throw the ball around and kind of put the icing on the cake. Um, you know, and you feel like at the time I remember thinking, Jesus, this is so easy. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we were both probably thinking we were going to go on to win 10 European Cups and 10 league trophies, you know, because the following week we played in the league final, which we actually, neither of us got on. Um, and it was kind of an unusual game. It was... 
we'd spent the week kind of celebrating winning Europe and you know I think we all thought we had Osprey's number and they came over and in fairness to us put in a really good performance um I think Dan Bigger got a kick from the touchline to beat us in you know pretty much the last play of the game but at the time you're thinking oh well at least we won Heineken Cup not the end of the world roll on to next season you're pretty wet behind the ears so my mum no, never miss never misses a game but obviously because I didn't think I'd actually play in the final I told her she was flying to Spain and she's like oh well I cancel my flight to Spain I was like oh no don't just go I won't be playing and while I got on because I as I said I only got told I was playing in the warm-up she was flying and when she landed she obviously found out I played and everything and she was heartbroken and I don't think for, for three weeks she'd do anything I asked her if I ever wanted food anything made she'd be straight over dinner for me so <laughs> she was heartbroken because she literally would go to every game and she she couldn't believe she missed it because she didn't even get to see it so yeah poor woman I was poor your poor mother but um going back to that call up to that, that in that game you know Joe Schmidt obviously you know back to you to to be good enough to be on the bench or even start, you know, obviously injuries were the main reason that you were there, but obviously you were good enough to, to be there as well. And Joe Schmidt has gone down like in history books and he's a legendary coach. And I suppose he was there at the start of your career with Leinster and then um, at the end with, with your Ireland career. And like, how did your relationship change from the beginning to the, to the end of that really? Yeah, well, I, I think we always got on. It's just, I think sometimes, Probably having him young probably worked out badly in my favor in terms of back then I was probably pretty relaxed in terms of probably slightly naive. I wouldn't have been one to to be big into watching training, being real precise with knowing all the plays, stuff like that. I kind of more relied on just playing rugby and, and kind of getting away with, with probably practicing a lot and, and being decent footballer. So um, something that definitely later on in my career uh, now and stuff I'd make sure I know all my, my plays inside out and, and make sure I don't make mistakes like that but I found maybe that kind of pigeonholed me sometimes in terms of um, anything I did wrong would probably be overemphasized where things I do right probably um, would just kind of go under under the radar and stuff like that so um, it probably worked badly in my favour I'd say having them quite young for that reason but also having them young was unbelievable for, for certain habits and um, I could always hear him screaming uh, when I wasn't working hard enough to get back off kicks and stuff like that. So he definitely gave me a lot of good traits as a young player and, and probably having him young was a blessing um, for me as a rugby player. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know why I probably didn't get picked as much, but, um, yeah, it was, it was disappointing to not make that World Cup squad. And, and that's probably the last time I talked to him. And probably for the first time in eight or nine years, I, I told him how I felt and, and thought I should have been in there longer anyway than getting, getting cut quite early. But, um, as I said, fond memories of, of having him as a coach early days and, and he gave me a lot of good habits. Do you think that he pigeonholed you like as an older player he just remembered you as that young player that he had once coached in Leinster and, and anytime you know he thought about you he thought of you as young John Cooney you know young John Cooney who didn't know his plays in that? Yeah I, I think it's I probably what played here now for or rugby for about 10 years and in and yourself probably the same I think sometimes coaches are going to have a narrative and, and a thought of you and a lot of the time they're going to make everything that you do fit that narrative so sometimes you could do 10 good things and one bad thing and, and they'll probably only just remember the bad thing so and um, it can work the other way you can have a coach that likes you and you can make mistakes and they don't even realize it so i've just realized that i'm going to just try and do what i do and, and what suits best for me and and as i have matt o'connor in the past a, a coach who didn't rate me and, and then I've Dan here who, who lets me express myself so same with Pat Lamb he let me express myself so you, you never know what a coach is going to think of, think of you and one coach could love you and one coach could hate you so and um, I've just realized that just being myself and, and playing the way I like to play is, is going to get the best out of me and, and hopefully a coach respects me for that. Yeah I think that's a great point John there like you know a coach has to justify his selection every week you know, there's going to be a coaches meeting between the backs coach, the attack coach, the D coach, the director rugby, whatever. Like, the, and they're going to just be discussing, you know, probably 25, 30 players that are up for selection every week, and they're going to have to give an excuse. Why are we going with Connor instead of John? And you know, if an easy one is there, oh, um, oh I thought John did his own thing during the week in training, and then all the other coaches roll in behind that and. 
before you know it, you kind of get tagged with that. It's very hard to to mm-hmm. shake those tags. Whereas, and similarly, when they're positive as well, like when you know when a coach steps up and says, "Oh, well, Connor stuck to the game plan really well in training this week," and then they all row in behind that, it's kind of infectious, and it can be very hard to change a coach's opinion of you. Like Dan McFarland, funny enough, was the forwards coach in my first year at under twenty level. So I was you know eighteen, fresh out of school didn't know a whole lot about the game other than schools rugby and Eric Elwood was our coach and you know Eric wanted to play a really kind of structured game plan and I'd never really done that in school you know I'd, I'd always you know ran the ball for my own half and and we had a good back line underage and that's all I really knew I hadn't really been thought any other way to play the game and ultimately Eric would have thought that I was a player that did my own thing and he would have heard that from from Eric and Dan would have believed it so you know, 10 years later when I'm up in Ulster and he's probably thinking, ah, Ian Madigan, he just does his own thing. But little does he know that, you know, I've been playing away for the last 10 years and you learn a lot, you learn off different coaches, you learn off different players. And, you know, I think players do change over time. You know, I think you can definitely say, oh, that guy still makes the same mistakes or he still has a tendency to do that. But good players will learn as they go along and, and also, I think as well, the game changes as you know changes a huge huge amount, even in the space of a kind of two or three year period. You know, the the game changes. Like I remember looking back, I think we watched that European final together, and I was looking at it going, "Oh my god, it's just nothing as physical as it is now." You know, and yeah. um, I think that's something that you can that can actually go against you when you have a, a coach who coach you when you're underage, um, and then you know rugby comes around in full circles and you have them again. Absolutely. And and John, like you, you've spoken before, like you mentioned Matt O'Connor there, but you've spoken before about Matt O'Connor and that decision to leave Leinster and go on loan to Connacht. Like, you know, you have to make the best decision for you. And and I suppose that loan period was really beneficial for you as a, as a player and to, for your development as a player. Yeah. Um, I, I still remember when he, he called me, I, I took him more. He, he kind of, rang me and was like, oh, um, I was due to get surgery on my shoulder. So he made it out like it would be good for me to go. But I felt like he was just getting rid of me. But it actually worked out that my mum's from from between Mayo and Saigo. So we have a house in Ballina. So I've always had a, a big connection with Connick. So um, I was actually in Ballina when he called me. So it was a bit of a sign that I should probably do it. So originally when, when he did do it, I, I thought he was just getting rid of me and I was quite annoyed. But it kind of made sense to me to come back from injury and, and get up to Connick and get some games. But these couple of years around then just seemed like I was bad luck, Brian. So basically the whole terms of it was to train with Leinster and do all my rehab. So I had to do it till September, which then meant that I was getting to Connick when the season started. So therefore I was way behind. So when I got there, I didn't get my first cap till December um, and it took me ages to get into the team. So then eventually I got a couple of games and started playing well, but, um, I actually was the only player to to get called back. So the whole terms was that any week they could call me back if they needed me. So I remember being in Dublin on a Sunday and actually in Dundrum Shopping Centre and getting a call off Guy Easterby to, to tell me I could be coming in the next day, which was obviously awkward because I had been in Connacht for like five months. And, you know, when you're a bit of an kind of outlier, you feel a bit awkward going back into a club you're not really playing for anymore. Um, so I went in and, and I was getting new gym programs and, and stuff like that because nobody knew how long I was going to be back for. So I was just getting on with it or whatever. But it was actually probably the best training week I've ever had with Lancer because I, I didn't really care. I was like, well, I'm probably going back to, to Connacht anyway. So I was just going myself and training, making breaks and stuff and, and enjoying it. Um, and then I came on in the game. As I said, I didn't really care. I, I got the ball, grubbered it to the corner and Dave Carney scores for us to go ahead. Um, and then we actually lost the Dragons. We gave away a penalty at the end to lose. So I remember being in the changing rooms, happy with how I went. And Matt O'Connor just coming over going, yeah, you can you can go back to Connacht. I was like, okay, great. Um, so I went back to Connacht, played Dragons the week after again. So I'm the only player to play a team two weeks in a row. <laughs> um, they were kind of looking... They were looking at me before, hey, so like, were you not playing this last week? Um, <laughs> Ended up having, having a good game, got man the match and stuff, and, and kind of kicked on there with and um, to the end of that season. But the annoying thing was was that they could still get me back. So Matt O'Connor then rang me um, saying that they might call me back. Um, so I then texted him saying I don't want to come back because um, I, I just didn't see eye to eye with him. 
I didn't see, I didn't believe him that he rated me. So um, I then, they actually offered me a two-year contract, um, which I rang Joe Schmidt about um, to ask him what do you think was the best option for me. And he just said, wherever I'm happiest. So um, on the morning of it, I, I was due, I was going to re-sign with Leinster and change my mind in the morning saying, no, I really like it in Connacht. This is this is where my friends are and this is where I see kind of future for me. And, and on that morning, I, I changed my mind and stayed with Connacht and, and the year after we won the league. So it was um, probably the best decision I made. It's so funny that like when when you're good, like I really want you and then he can just change his mind. And it, it was kind of a nightmare situation for you to be in because, you know, if you played well, they'd want you back. But if you didn't play well, you know, they were happy to have you in Connacht. But it, it was good, I suppose, finally that the decision ultimately lay in your own hands. And well, it's worked out pretty well for you so far. And obviously that year winning, winning with Connacht. Um, and then bring us through your decision to to move to Ulster. P and I was after leaving and we had Darren Cave chat about him last week and how how much they, you know, almost mourned over, over losing him and it must have been a tough time. Well, like, you know, a great opportunity to go in and, you know, into that position, um, but big shoes to fill at the same time. Yeah, that, that was the first joke I made it was about, I said, sorry about the passing of Ruan, as in, because it felt like he died. Um, but nobody got it. They thought him like his, they, they thought him his bad passing, and it just went down so badly. And no one laughed. I was just like, oh, this is a great first day. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it was interesting. I, I what else, what else really happened on your first day, Johnny? <laughs> I had an awful first day. I hated it. I was ready to go back to comment. I got told so my first day, I I met our fitness coach who I knew, Kev Geary. And I, I've always been big into doing my extras. So I was like, oh, what gym can we go use? And he's like, we don't use another gym. You use this gym. I was like, oh, geez. Okay, that's not a good start. Um, and then I was doing uh, speed. And I was just trying to talk to people. And people were asking me questions. And I was just basically not concentrating the whole session. And the other fitness coach then pulled me aside after and giving out to me as well, telling me I need to concentrate. And um, so I ended up having to text both of them at the end of the day, apologizing. Um, but I also didn't have a house to live in, so I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor of, of a friend's brother's house. So it was just a bad first day. I was ready, ready to get in the car and leave, probably. Well, look, it's only gone up since there, anyway, with Ulster, and and you seem to be really enjoying your uh, your rugby. Um, just one quick, one quick, really interesting question is: Who is your your favourite uh, ten to play with up in Ulster? Oh Jesus! You. I, I, <laughs> I'm going to say Ian, obviously, but Billy Burns very emotional. He'd be heartbroken tomorrow. He'd come in and, and make me feel bad. So I'll, I'll just say it was Christian, Leo Leofano, when he was here and he's gone. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's the politicians, the politicians answer there for sure. Um, John, okay, exactly. it's time for the House of Rugby Challenge. So each week we ask our guests to talk about three items for us and hopefully there is a nice story behind each of them. So the three pieces are a piece of rugby memorabilia, a jersey you have swapped and held on to and something non-rugby that you treasure. So we'll start off with the the piece of rugby memorabilia first. You'll be surprised. Actually, like football is probably a sport I prefer. So I've, I've actually got football jerseys up in I have a, uh, a bit of a man cave upstairs it's, it's a bit grimy but um I have a couple of football frame jerseys there's a messy jersey frame which is probably uh, my prize possession up there but I also got a jersey this is probably the third question from there's a basketballer Isaiah Thomas who uh used to play for the Boston Celtics he's actually only small he's like Ian's height I think he's like five five eight or something <laughs> <Come> <laughs> I'm taller than you. <laughs> I'm six foot. Are you joking? You are not six foot. <laughs> anyway, oh, so uh, during lockdown, I, I tagged Isaiah Thomas in a, in a story or something, and he replied. And then another week later, I probably had too many whiskeys at home, and I, I messaged him going, "Are you keen for a jersey swap?" Him probably not even knowing what rugby is, and and he replied saying, "Yeah, I got you." Um, and then I keep potholing him. I gave him my address, and about two months later, he he sent me a signed uh, Washington Wizards jersey, which I have framed up in that room. And it's unbelievable. I I, I don't think he ever wanted my jersey, so I never sent it to him. What a red. I bought him a bottle of whiskey. Bought him a bottle of whiskey to say thanks. Um, so that's probably my my prized possession up there, just because if you if you don't know much about him, um, he's got a good documentary on YouTube, Book of Isaiah, where his his sister actually passed away, and, and he played a, a basketball game the next day. And I just thought it was unbelievable the the kind of 
ability for him to, to do that the next day. And, and then they also went and traded him. So it, it's pretty, pretty tough watch and pretty heartbreaking, but he still works incredibly hard. And I took a lot of inspiration from him. So to have that jersey up in my room is, is pretty cool. Yeah, really cool. So you kind of covered the piece of rugby memorabilia and the jersey that you swapped. And even if he didn't really want, even if he didn't want your jersey, which one did you send him? I didn't. I didn't send him one because I thought he wouldn't wouldn't even want it. To be honest, he he's a big dog and he wouldn't want some Irish rugby player to send him a jersey. But I actually do. I do have a good jersey that I, I have kept on my first cap against Japan. And um, Michael Leach gave me his his number six jersey. Um, so that was pretty cool of him and to not even take my jersey he gave me his so um i have that in dublin and, and soon to be framed it's pretty cool to have the captain of japan's jersey that's unreal yeah really unreal and what about something non-rugby that you treasure non-rugby that i treasure um yeah Michael Owen dog, is my, is my... <laughs> oh sorry yeah i was going to say my michael Owen jersey, but it is the dog <laughs> Either way, either way Clint, my girlfriend's going to kick the, kick the crap out of me because she hates that Michael Owen jersey. And, and for me not to say the dog, she'd, she'd kill me. So um, I'd actually never had it. It's, it's Claire's family dog. And uh, she brought brought her up about a year ago. And, and when she first came up, I was, I'd never had a dog. So I was like, oh, she's not up on the couch. She's not going to be up in the room with us. And now she literally sleeps at the bottom of her bed and she does anything she wants. So I've fully turned into one of those dog people, even set her up on Instagram, which... I used to think was the lamest thing going and now it's probably the highlight of my day is, is using her Instagram and I probably don't use mine anymore. So I've become <laughs> that crazy dog person. Maybe it's 2020 in lockdown, but um, yeah, I've become that lame person now. If ever there was a year to do that, I think 2020 and 2021 is, it's a good enough excuse anyway to have lost your marbles. But uh, tell us a bit about the Michael Owen one. It, it's just a signed jersey, um, but when I was young, he was he was the, the biggest footballer to me. I remember I used to get up and watch Michael Owen soccer school on a Saturday morning, and I, I did project on him, and I used to be obsessed with him, and it, it's pretty heartbreaking because he's incredibly boring now, and he's, he's awful when he does punch a tree, so um, it, it's kind of kind of tough to see that now, but as a, as a footballer, all I used to do is try and emulate him with his little, his little flick, and uh, yeah, he was my, my go-to footballer at a young age. Well, that's great stuff. So we're going to just take a short break and we'll be back to talk about all the pre-game rituals in the dressing room, some kicking competitions at Ulster, and John will answer some listeners' questions in the House of Rugby Hall of Fame. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game changed. So welcome back to part two, and we're going to start with the Guinness House of Rugby Hall of Fame. We asked our Facebook group if you had any good questions for John, and we had an avalanche of questions, and here are the top three. The first one, what does John consider to be the best contributing attributes to the team or squad during game day? Asked by Peter English, a tough one to start with. Yeah, it is. Um, I'm probably, from earlier on in my career, I probably would have been one of those people bouncing around, trying to get psyched up for games, but I've kind of gone the other way now, especially... Uh, with kicking and stuff like that I try to stay as relaxed as I can before the game and it's funny because everyone comes around slapping your hand and stuff and so I'm just sitting in my spot and I'm like okay thanks good luck yeah thanks yeah thanks so everyone's coming around and trying to uh, relax my breathing and stuff like that and um, but yeah uh, people like Alan O'Connor um, will be jumping around cursing every every two seconds so there's two types of people I, I like to stay with myself and, and watch kind of videos of Tiger Woods or, or Kobe Bryant and and then you've got people like Ian as well, getting everyone hyped up. He's a bit of a hype up merchant. So um, there's two types of people I find in the changing rooms. And, and I think Ian, Ian, before we played Leinster uh, after lockdown, um, I remember coming in and for the first minute, everyone kind of just stays relaxed and, and waits for the coaches to come in and say stuff. And then the corner of my eye, I just see him jumping up, screaming, and telling us to get ready to go again. And I just remember it was like the elephant in the room after, after the game. But everyone's like, are we going to bring up uh, Ian's halftime talk there? Um, but yeah, he, I think he had us all, all raring to go in the second half. So that's probably one of my my fond memories recently. Yeah, I love it. I love the the pregame stuff. I've tried different things throughout my career between being more relaxed and and um, you know, I've I've there's definitely been times in my career that I've gone gone too far and I've been too pumped up and you know I think as halfbacks it's very important that we've got to be in control of our emotions and being able to 
think our way through a game, especially the first five, ten minutes, it's you know so important that your team gets a foothold in the game. But I also still feel passionately that you know getting psyched up for a game at the end of the day, you're going out into a full contact sport is a huge part of it. And um, you know, I use that kind of last minute before we leave the change room to get my key messages across. You know, g the guys up, fill them up with confidence, and um, you know, ultimately away we go. And that's a it's a part of it that I've I've really grown to enjoy as as the years have gone on in my career. You know, it's um, it, it is a special time before you go out. Everyone's tense, everyone's nervous, and you're about to put it all on the line. And you know, I like getting behind that. I think um I think coaches like to see you know that you're prepared as well and that like you know that you're you're getting ready for the game and I have a really funny memory of when we played England it was a two years ago three years ago in Six Nations at home and we were like singing a Westlife songs on the way to Captain's Run like blaring songs and like got up and down the bus with a speaker and um we had a shot in Captain's Run and we lost to England the next day and like it was nothing to do with our captain's run, like nothing to do with our captain's run and our Westlife songs. Like, you know, we just weren't good enough on the day, but we got slated <laughs> for how we were, for how we acted on the bus on the way to captain's run because we were singing songs. And from that day on, everyone now is like sitting in their own seats, earphones in, no sound like, and I always forget my earphones and no one sits beside me on the bus. No one sits beside anybody on captain's run anymore. And I'm just looking around, but like, is anyone around that I can talk to? Like, is anyone up for the crack? Like, no one wants to talk because everyone is like scared shitless of getting eaten again, like we did that day against England. But uh, so, I, yeah, I think it's it's important to have like a mix of Ian and a mix of you as well, John, for that. Yeah. Um, we're going to question, question number two. Just um, just on that, we've played... actually, we've, a... oh, just, yeah, just on that one, we have a good one where basically the, the speaker is passed around within the team each week. Um, so let's say John gets it this week. He gets to effectively pick the music for the week. So for some of our training sessions, we'd start off with a bit of music. And, you know, I've been in teams where co the head coach would say, no music in the change room. If you want to listen to music, put your own headphones on. You're not going to be disrupting anyone else. And then there's other train of thoughts out there that, you know, say, look, there is something about everyone listening to the same stuff, bopping along. It can create a, you know, an atmosphere within it. And, you know, Ulster has been like that since I've arrived. But um, I remember playing Connacht away around Christmas time and Tom O'Toole was looking after the music and he just had the most head wrecking music on before the game. And I was I was nervous as trying to go through the plays in my head and it was just this, do, 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 do. I just turn around and I go, Tom, change that fucking song. <laughs> you know, and it was just like, but even that for me, it kind of made me realize, geez, I'm actually pretty nervy here and like releasing it out on him definitely helped me. Like, so, and we had a good laugh about, you know, what we were doing our warm up, and it just, it does create a togetherness um, and you can lose that with just everyone being on your on your headphones. It almost creates people being more on their phones, which saps the energy and it's not something you want. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Agreed. Um, question number two in our Guinness House of Rugby Hall of Fame is my son plays for Terenure under 12s. We would love to hear John's advice on John's progress from playing for his home club Terenure Rugby to Leinster Rugby and beyond. And that's from Margaret Hall. Oh, I know, Margaret. Um, hello. Um, yeah, Terenure is my local club. Um, I actually didn't start playing rugby till I, till I was 12. So um, I played at soccer before that and I was quite late to it. So, um, yeah, so I can't really give them too much information about playing at a young age. But uh, for me, I was quite lucky. I went to Gonzaga and I was actually, I didn't know how to pass off my left hand. So I used to invert it and pass off my right. Um, but luckily, Gonzaga, <laughs> Gonzaga were pretty crap. So they put me me on the A's um, at Scrum Half and that I just kind of stayed there for a couple of years and yeah I think it was just for me it was always just about I was always competitive so it was just about slightly getting better and um, mm. each year and fifth year I was on the bench and, and worked pretty hard that summer at, at, at trying to get a, a starting role for Gonzaga as I said they weren't even the best so um, for me it was just probably that year when I was probably around 17 where and I probably put in the most work I had and, and out of nowhere somehow I got a Leinster trial and kind of kicked on from there. So for me, it was just in, enjoying playing rugby and probably not putting yourself under too much pressure and, and kind of continuously practicing 
um, even your weaknesses. And I, I always like to put quote as like work on your weaknesses until they become your strengths. So that was probably something I took at, at that age was was trying to get better at things I wasn't very good at. I'm going to really look at your left hand pass now the next time you're playing just to see if there's any <laughs> playing <or that. laughs> That, that, that's in the past, I can pass now. <laughs> I actually, I don't know, did I read an article or listen to a podcast with you before? And um, you spoke about how, like, you actually are pretty decent at soccer. Like, you did you have to make a decision to, like, choose rugby over soccer? Well, I always get slagged from the lads because I always bring up soccer. I come from a football background. And they, <laughs> they all, like, slagging me. <laughs> they all abuse me for that because I probably said it 50 times. Um, I, I, was, I, I played for my local club and I'd say at a young age you kind of have to make a decision early but once I started playing rugby I was, I was playing that five times a week so I just liked playing on a Sunday with my mates so I, I enjoyed that and, and I played till I was 18 so I used to go from Lens to Tras and then just drive straight over to, to football games straight after um, but yeah for me I, I'd love to play even a year Sunday league when I retire that would be my, my dream I don't think I'll play rugby um, when I give up I would only go play hell. I'll be straight to Sunday league and um, up top uh, playing striker. That'll be my my life goal now. <laughs> you won't, mate. You're playing corner back. You play sp- your speed. No, you man. <laughs> um, I don't pass. I'm a I'm a glory I'm a striker. Give me the ball. Yeah. Oh, I've seen John play soccer. He's very impressive. Um, he's actually. What's the team that you support up here? Like the local team that play in the oh, Cor- Corrine. Corrine. I'm a show pony yeah. though I'm a show pony I'm good for a few tricks <laughs> John told Corrine we're trying to sign him up so that he, John had been to a few of their games and they, and they gave him a jersey with Cooney 9 on the back and he thought like geez I could be getting a contract off the back of these guys <laughs> <laughs> I was honestly close to the convention during lockdown and be like can I come train with you because I was training on my own I was like I'd love to go and play uh, that'd be brilliant Well, it's your lifelong goal, so hopefully you get to reach that goal at some stage. And the third question, who I think a lot of people are, are really eager to find out about this, I that myself involved, myself included, actually, is you've got to ask him about the halftime race to beat Craig Casey off the pitch. I seriously like to hear his reasoning behind this from Len Carmody. You actually shared this on your story as well. So give us a bit of an insight into that. Oh, I knew this coming up. Um, I, I was... Ex- I got a few messages from people thinking I had to run to the toilet, um, but that wasn't the case. <laughs> or, sorry, the Casey, if they're going to put a pun in there. Um, for me, yeah, it's just I'm a competitive individual and I just felt like having a race, I think. I just felt like racing off the field for a bit of crack. Um, I think I'd, I'd seen him play a few games and I, I knew he took a, a massive amount of, of confidence from, from being the first off the field at half time. So, I told myself for, for a bit of crack, I'll, I'll race him off. And I nearly forgot when I saw him go to run, I was on the far side of the field. I, I just kind of kicked in and I started running by him. And <laughs> thought it was just a bit of fun. Um, I don't know why I'm probably a bit of a lunatic, but I, I thought it was funny. And I had Jack Hardy messaging me within an hour after the game, be like, sent the video to me, be like, what the hell are you doing, you lunatic? Um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be brought up for a while and if we're ever in Ireland camp again, I'm sure they'll, they'll enjoy trying it up. I just thought it'd be funny and um, run a, a young lad off the field just to show that I'm still a young pup. We loved it anyway, Johnny. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't have done oh, it. Oh, it's nice to see a different side of it. I wasted all my energy. I had no energy left. <laughs> Well, cheers for that and cheers for the insight and answering all those questions. And Peter English, you are our House of Rugby Hall of Fame winner. So welcome to the Hall of Fame. Um, so I suppose leading back into going back into the superstitions and I suppose pre-game rituals. Um, John, is there any like superstitions that you have prior to a game? Like, do you have to wear a certain type of boots or do you have to, you know, practice how many kicks before a game just to be ready? Like what what are your pre-game superstitions? Um, I actually probably wouldn't be superstitious at all. The only thing is my, my boots. I generally would wear boots that I'm used to wearing and, and ones I feel comfortable in. That Leinster game the other week, I, I went to tighten my stud and it bre- broke in the boots. So I had to wear a brand new pair of boots I'd never worn. So I was slightly nervous in the warm up, but um, it actually went quite well for me. But I'd be, I'd be very regimented with the, the day before every game. 
Um, I'd always make sure I take 40 minutes an hour going through the game. Um, and and something I'd be big into listening to podcasts. I took um, affirmations. I, I listened to a podcast a couple of years ago on the creator Dilbert and the importance of kind of affirmations and writing down what you want to do. And it's probably something in the last three years that I'm, I'm always do before games. And it's definitely given me more of a crossover between goals I set for games and actually completing them in games. And um, sometimes when I don't get them, I'll just dismiss it saying that's not why. And, and when I do get them, that I put a lot of it down to that prep that I do before every game. And I'd sometimes even write the goal 50 to 60 times on the back pages of my book. And, and it's probably a slight insight into what I do before games, but it, it definitely makes a massive difference for me. And, visualization of what I'm going to do, stuff like that. I, I find since I've done it, it's, a, it's had a massive impact on my game. Yeah, big time. Do you have any same. superstitions? Yeah. Um, no, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be superstitious, but I'd be very um, process driven, similar to John. You know, I like going through the same routine um, the day before a game, the same routine the day of a game. Do a lot of rolling out, stretching, mental preparation, going through the game plan. Um, I like to eat the same foods around game time, you know, spaghetti bolognese the night before, you know, Weedabix the morning of a game. It's just, you know, I don't want anything different in there that could potentially throw me. Um, when I, During my time in Bristol, they, gonna, they actually, yeah. In, would, you, would you cook that spaghetti bolognese yourself and everything like from scratch? Um, no, no, Emer. <laughs> <laughs> no, luckily I have Anna here, who's the head chef. I might do some of the chopping, but not before game night. She'd want me getting my rest, and she'd uh, look after it all. She's brilliant, so I'm very lucky. Um, if you did any, if you even attempted that chopping prior to a game, you'd probably lose your finger. <laughs> so maybe just stay away from the from from the preparation. Yeah exactly if anyone was watching the cooking during the week you'd see that i don't have a clue what i'm doing so um yeah look maybe the next lockdown i might learn but it hasn't happened yet um but yeah during my time in bristol we used to go to the stadium pretty early before games like pat would have us there you know nearly four or five hours before kickoff and we'd eat as a team and then kind of go through our routine and you know, during the three years there, I kind of became quite accustomed to it and I saw the benefits of it. And when we're playing at home now and in uh, Ravenhill, I like getting in there, you know, three or four hours beforehand, get in with the physios, get in with the masseuse, kind of go through my own movement preparation. And then I'll head over to the change room and I like being there when guys are arriving. You know, I think it, it can set the tone for the evening. You know, if you're going in or if, as lads are coming into the dressing room, if you're there set up and you're, you know, high energy and giving them a big high five and a hug and you know you they are kind of builds their excitement and um i've grown to really love that process of it yeah that's great um it's really interesting the the process driven both of you are maybe that's just a decision maker or a nine or ten thing but sports psychology is i suppose growing and the more you know more we chat to athletes the more we realize the importance of sports psychology and John particularly for you you've had a few you know knocks along the way it hasn't been plain sailing by any means you know your 2019 World Cup omission to come back and play great in the Six Nations to almost start to start that French game that never went ahead to not making that Autumn Nations team how difficult was that to come back from like what did you do to make yourself i suppose more resilient to bounce back from from those disappointments yeah i, I think i've learned a lot through injuries i think that kind of helped me a lot through resilience and something i take uh, the, probably the biggest thing i've learned as a rugby player just in life is, is studying other people and for me it's not really irish sport it's american sport and i took a lot from kobe bryant and, and there's another guy inky johnson and through my last shoulder surgery he, he talks when you get to a point where things get difficult and, and if you're only doing it for yourself, eventually you're going to hit something harder than you and you're going to give up. So my family did a lot for me and stuff and, and my girlfriend. So for me, that's something I kind of fall back on when I'm struggling. So the difference between that World Cup and, and probably not making the Six Nations recently was that um, for me after the World Cup, I, I really enjoy my uh, company in Ulster and it was easy for me to go back there because I love it there and as disappointing it was to make the World Cup, I thought, okay, well, I'll go back to work with us and, and things will be great. But what I found difficult recently was was that, that 
with COVID, it's so it's all up in the air and games mightn't be going ahead and, and going back to Ulster was just uncertain. And I'd be lying to say that the final didn't really upset me as well. So I was, I was still disappointed from that. So it, it kind of was compounded by not making that Six Nations squad. So um, it was a couple of a couple of difficult months. And yeah, I probably went back to, to things I had practiced in the past and, and checked in with people that I probably used in the past as well. And it got to the point where I probably realized how fickle sport was and, and that it can change so quickly. So for me, I, I, I realized that I have to take a little bit of the emotion I was probably investing into rugby and into, into sport and, and realizing that, okay, well, it's just a game at the end of the day. And I think that kind of took the pressure off myself and, and just kind of went back to Ulster and said, I'm just going to enjoy playing rugby and, and, and do what I can do well here. And, and that's probably what kind of got me out the other side of it and got me back playing good rugby. So the stuff like competitions at Ulster, that kind of stuff kept you going, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to get into that. I've lost, I'd say, like 50 quid buying in donuts and coffee. So when he first came, I think I think I won the first one in the summer. And I was like, ah, oh, happy days. And then after that, he's, he's, he's played me. He's like, okay, for now I'll put donut and coffees on it. I think I lost the next four or something. And he come over, are we kicking, are we? I'm like, no, I'm kicking on my own. Go away. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't done a kicking competition with him since because my confidence was too low. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. You've been kicking yeah. well, though. You need to pick. <laughs> I just couldn't anyway. Like, different competition. I know. Uh, get Mike Larry to step up. Play. He's usually good for it. He knows, he knows how to play me. He was just picking his good spots and I was missing. I'd just be like, okay, go on. I'm kicking on my own here. <laughs> you need to choose your opponents wisely next time, John. I anyway, decided trying to make to everyone. kicks as long as possible so Mike Larry could reach it from 45. So cheers to everybody for watching and listening. Don't forget, you can continue to get involved in our Facebook group and on Twitter. A big thank you to producer Pat, Paul, Dermot, Anthony, Paddy, and everyone that helped getting this show together. This has been House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe, together with Guinness Sláin Gafo. Sláin. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game change.